and gentlemen, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now, before I begin my story on teaching, I wanted to talk about a story that moved me, that moved me and that kind of encapsulates my entire teaching philosophy. And for those of you who have been in my class, you'll know the story as the one of the soldier and the journalist. So what happens here is one of my teachers, Sheikh al masiri before he passed away, he wrote a story. A story of him going to the Egyptian side of the Rafah border crossing. And when he was there, he was with a group of journalists. And one of the journalists looked over and you can see the Palestinian side under occupation, under curfew. And you can see the army vehicles moving in synchronization, moving together, and a more luxury vehicle speeding around the Palestinian side of Rafah. Now seeing this scenario, one of the journalists among them, educated to a master's degree, looked upon this scenario and said, wow, look at that efficiency, look at that dynamism. Look at the way that they are so organized and working well together. And the soldier manning the gate, not very well educated, maybe he could barely read and write, he started laughing. And he said, they're, you look at them as if they're so organized and efficient, but they're really afraid. They're afraid of the Palestinians. Now, this one instance encapsulates the problem of education today, particularly in our countries. Why is it that our education is producing people full of inner defeat? Why is it not producing the soldier? Irrespective of the circumstances, he is one who longs for victory. That's the problem. And that problem motivated me to rethink how is it that we should be teaching? Do we want after all the education and all the effort to have raised young men and women who will be defeatist, who won't be able to acknowledge the sacrifices and struggles of the others? Or do we want and do we see that there is more wisdom and more courage in the simple soldier? So we need to change this. We need our educated people to become like that soldier. That's what we need. And so to that, I'm here to talk a little bit about my story on teaching. And that story, ladies and gentlemen, includes four key themes that I believe resonates with the students. And I take no credit for this. And that too is a part of our teaching. That success is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We make our effort, but we take no credit for the victory or the successes that come our way. So those four key themes, empowerment, taqiyya, unity of knowledge, and I'll explain all of them as we go along, wahdatul ilm, and critical self-reflection, what I like to refer to, uh, and I'll explain it as well as fiqh, and lastly, Allah knows best, but this is encapsulated in, in a phrase in Arabic that's used throughout the Muslim world, Allahu Alam. The power in this phrase cannot be overemphasized. But as we start, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I, how I engage in my classroom. So every day when I walk into my classroom, I feel as though I'm walking onto a ship and the students are there waiting to embark with me on a journey. So we're in it together. And as we set sail, the lesson begins, the anchors are pulled up, the rope is untied from the port, and we sail off. You can hear it. Someone scream, all hands on deck, anchors away, and we're off. We're off into a new world. We're off into a world full of imagination, and we're in it together. And we're looking at all our surroundings. We see the turbulent waters. We see perhaps the calm serenity and a new dawn in front of us, every class, 
I wish to be like that, a journey. And it has to be together. I want us to see, feel, and share those experiences, all of us together. And every class, I want us to feel as if we're sailing away. But that has to be done with clarity. If there is no clarity, it can't be done. So how do we achieve that clarity? Well, I need the students to be willing participants to come on this journey. They need to feel it as much as I'm feeling it. And that can only happen if I'm empowering them. And this is empowerment. This is what it really means. I need them to feel one. I need them to feel as much a part of this uh, voyage as I'm on it. I don't look at myself as the captain leading but as one amongst equals that is being led as much by them as they are by me. And you'll notice that a successful classroom does that. It shifts according to the sentiments of the students and you have to feel it. So how else could I share with you this idea of empowerment knowing that you need to willingly be part of this journey? I'll give you the example of Hazrat Umar Adlaan when he wrote a letter to Amr ibn al-As at that time who was the governor of Egypt. There was a new mosque that was constructed. And as I'm sure many of you are know architecturally, the mihrab within the masjid is, a, is something that was added later. It was never in the old constructions of the masjid. So this mihrab, of course, elevates the speaker. So when Umar radiallahu heard of this, he wrote a letter to Amr, the governor of Egypt, and said, I hear now that you have raised yourself above the believers. Wasn't it enough that you were standing and they were sitting? Now you have to lift yourself higher. I urge you to smash it to pieces. Here we have, I think, one of the clearest examples of the success, the reasons behind the success of those earlier generations. And while we do not claim to want to relive that specific time, we do wish to keep that specific value. Because that value is the one that time and time again has been proven the value of success. When you make, as an educator, the students feel as empowered and as equal as myself, even if I'm the one that happens to have prepared the lecture. And there are many examples. Salahuddin Ayyubi, and I remember this, that after the victory of Hittin, which set the stage for the conquest of Al-Quds, he was sitting outside his tent, exhausted. And a soldier comes to him with a piece of paper, shoves it in his face. The master must sign. With that tone, with that attitude, with that demeaning behavior, and what did Salahuddin do in return? How did he respond to someone who was so rebellious, <coughs> excuse me, rebellious, insolent, rude? Did he stand up and say, how dare you speak to me like that? He pleaded with him. He said, I'm tired. He said, can you come back after an hour? We just had a, a war. I'm a little bit exhausted. And the soldier insisted the master must sign. And Salahuddin so turns and says, I have no pen. And the soldier says, it's behind you, inside the tent. Go get it. And he turns. He goes, you're right. It's there. And he gets up, takes the pen, signs the document, and off goes the soldier. I want us to think about that for a moment. Think about what that means. What does it mean to be able to deal with people that may be rude with you in that way? That is the real understanding of empowerment. That is the real understanding of leadership. That's what we need if we want the same successes as what they have achieved. Now, by revealing this commitment to this journey, and by revealing that's important to feel those values, we're on the same page. We're in it together, we feel like it's one. And those common themes are what drive us. 
And among those common themes, I believe, who said it best was Picasso. And it's one of my particularly favorite quotes of his. I believe it really also sends another message of empowerment. It took me my whole life to learn to draw like a child. How does a child draw? I watch my son sometimes and I understand. How does a child draw? It draws fearlessly. That's how it draws. It draws not thinking it can make a mistake. It draws not thinking, will people like it? It takes risks. That's what children do. But is our education making us capable of taking those risks? Is it doing that to us? Or is it doing something different? As children, they often believe, yes, I can. Our education starts to slowly put the idea, no, you can't. So the more we are taught when we're younger, yes, we can, our surroundings, our education, teach us the opposite. And I've always thought about that. I've always thought, why is it that a child feels no fear? Why is it a child, it'll taste anything. It doesn't think, what will it taste like? And then it spits it out later. But it tries it. It takes that chance. And this is what I want for my students. I want that fearlessness. I want that ferocity. But not between one another. Not while we're in the masjid together, or while we're walking together, or driving together. Don't show your bravery to one another. That's not going to get you anywhere. Humility with one another. Softness with one another. Make excuses for one another. That's empowerment. And that's what I feel is the truest form of educating our young people in the same direction that I believe our ancestors, intellectual or spiritual, educated us. I often think of another thing. Children can see angels. We say this, after all, in our culture, that when children are smiling, they're looking at the angels. What happened? I don't see any. What is the difference between my son's eyes and my eyes? How can he see something that is there? I can't see it anymore. What barriers have blocked those angels from me? Emotional barriers, spiritual barriers, mental barriers. So our education, by empowering you, breaks those barriers. Now, even if we cannot see those angels anymore, we trust that the angel is there. We, we trust that it's there and we believe in the unseen. And those values too contribute. I believe Rumi said it best when Rumi said, sell your cleverness by bewilderment. Fascinating, isn't it? What does it mean to sell your cleverness? Don't think of ourselves as so intelligent. Islamic education historically has had a wonderful way of teaching. It focuses on the heart, not on the intellect. Modern education is all focusing on your aqal. But Islamic education was focusing here. We need to re-understand those ancient values. We need to reincorporate them. That's what I try to do within my classes, and I believe that's why they're successful. It's not me. I'm just learning from our great forefathers and foremothers about what it really means to move forward together as a society. Now, the traditional educator follows a pattern that is really, you can, you can read it very easily. Guilt obligation verification. First they make you feel guilty. You don't know what you're supposed to know. Then they make you obligated that you must know this. You have to learn this. And then they test you to see if in fact indeed you have learned it. So guilt, obligation, verification are what the traditional educator does and it is the traditional power relations between a student and a professor, and it is unimaginative, uncreative, and wholly disempowering. You are not contributing. You are not on a journey together, sailing in a common direction, talking about what we see outside. You're not in that. 
Instead, you're in a cold, dry, dreary classroom. You're not on a ship. And what I want more than anything is for the students to learn that imagination. I want them to dream of those possibilities. And one of the things that I do in all my introductory classes, first thing, is I show this image to my students. I let them clear their minds. And I say to them, pause for a second. And how would you feel if I said to you that the technology and the design of this iPhone was made right here in Qatar? Almost always the same response. Laughter, disbelief, loud proclamations of no. What does that mean? And after the laughing subsides and they start snickering with one another, I tell them, you know, thank you. Thank you, you've just laughed at all of us. You've laughed at yourself. You can't conceive victory. You can't even conceive success. You can't think of it. It's impossible for learning to take shape in that kind of environment. So after the shock of what they've realized, after the exercise is over, they're quiet the rest of the class. They don't say anything. Because they realize it's one thing someone else laughing at you, it's quite another when you're laughing at yourself. And that is what I'm happy to see. I want, them not, I want them to stay silent. That means they're thinking about what I'm saying. And they'll go home and they'll think and maybe they'll even do it to their little brothers and sisters. And they'll try it out. But the result is that they've learned a valuable lesson. Don't defeat yourself. Believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then yourself is half the battle. That's half right there. Then effort, practice, is the second. Now, in addition, when I talk about the unity of knowledge, I want to focus on a very famous saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, treat all knowledge as your lost property. What a fantastic saying. Wherever you go, know that knowledge belongs to you as much as it does anyone else. What a pluralistic, inclusive vision that anyone can teach you. Knowledge is not just belonging to one group or one people. What a fantastic open vision. And that's what I want the students to grasp and to embrace. They can learn from anyone. The Chinese watched insects fighting to develop martial arts. The humility in that should be awing us all. And thirdly, coming to Fiqh. What I'm referring to is critical self-reflection. None of our education and our progress forward can be done excluding our local values and culture. We need that as our root. We want people to honor those values, not ridicule them. We want them to put them high and elevate those standards of behavior, not push them aside. That, with that comes this idea of really knowing yourself. And with that is victory. And lastly, of course, Allahu Alam. No other idea so greatly encapsulates the humility in Muslim civilization that with all of our education, I could be wrong. And when we talk to one another, let's remember that. And give the other person space to talk. With these <laughs> principles, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I believe we'll have a new educational awakening. Thank you.